Aloha, welcome. My name is Mark Schlav. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. And today we are going across the sea to Washington, D.C. to speak with Ann Wright. Ann Wright is a retired United States Army Colonel and State Department official. She is also a lawyer and also earned a master's degree in national security affairs. She was in the U.S. Army and the Reserves for about 29 years. She was a U.S. diplomat for 16 years and served in U.S. embassies around the world. She received the State Department Award for Heroism, 1997, after helping to evacuate several thousand people during the Civil War in Sierra Leone. However, in March of 2003, Anne resigned from the U.S. State Department in protest of the invasion of Iraq. And she is now a very vocal peace and anti-war activist. She's been involved in many matters, recently involving Korea and Iran as part of citizen peace movements and trying to make legislators aware of what's going on. Anne, welcome. Uh, it's good, good to see you. You're you, in Mark. Washington, D.C., on in between travels, as I understand. That's correct. I've been in Washington to uh, work on this uh, Korea Peace Now campaign that we have, trying to get uh, our government uh, to uh, sign a peace agreement with the North Koreans. And oh. so we've had um, uh, uh, women uh, parliamentarians from South Korea who have been here with us uh, talking to uh, U.S. legislators and trying to make sure that our government knows that the people of South Korea want a, an agreement to end this 70-year war uh, that has gone on on the Korean Peninsula. And I, I want to ask you in a, in a few minutes what the results of that have been. But first, I want to ask you a little bit about your background. You, you have been a soldier. You've been a, someone in the State Department and obviously uh, involved in matters that involved national security. But at some point in time, you, you decided uh, to go a different road. Uh, to become a peace activist, anti-war activist. How did that come about? What, what transition happened in your life or, or, or not? What, what made you move, and, and as I understand, uh, become very, very vocal uh, in, in the anti-war movement? Well, as you mentioned, I had uh, been in the U.S. military for 29 years, 13 on active duty and 16 in the reserves. I retired as a colonel. I then was in the U.S. Diplomatic Corps for 16 years and served in U.S. embassies in Nicaragua, Grenada, Somalia, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Sierra <laughs> Leone, Micronesia. I helped reopen the U.S. Embassy in Kabul, Afghanistan in December of 2001 and then went on to what turned out to be my last assignment, which was as the deputy ambassador for the U.S. Embassy in Mongolia. And it was 16 years ago today uh, that I resigned from the government. I resigned in opposition to the war that was going to start uh, within hours uh, the, on, on Iraq. I, I had served under eight different presidential administrations, starting with the Lyndon Johnson administration back in the 1960s, and that was during the Vietnam War. That's when I joined the military. Um, and as you can, if you go to the eight presidents uh, that I served under, there were plenty of policies that uh, were our, our government's policies that I did not necessarily agree with. But as a government employee, uh, you learn to hold your nose to a lot of things that you may, may not personally agree with. And it, you know, resignation is a pretty big step. Uh, most people will just right. find ways that they can find some program in the government that they can work on and feel like they're, they're doing what they need to do, that they are uh, you know, working for the good of the country, uh, even though there may be other policies that are going on that they may personally disagree with. And so that's how I ended up staying in the governments for so long. 
But finally, um, 16 years ago in March of 2003, I just could not, um, I couldn't come to grips with the decision of the Bush administration to invade and occupy the oil-rich Arab Muslim country of Iraq, which had nothing to do with 9-11. And it just mystified me why um, my boss, Colin Powell, uh, was making such statements at the UN. And you probably remember the briefing, the big briefing he gave right, about right, weapons yeah. destruction. That was sort of meant to justify the invasion. Yeah. And I didn't believe it. I mean, the, <laughs> the country of Iran had, or Iraq, pardon me, had been under sanctions for 10 years at that time uh, since uh, the Gulf War One, And we had, we, the United States, had had hundreds of weapons inspectors in there over the years uh, under the guise of the UN uh, nuclear inspectors and weapons of mass destruction inspectors. And they had all come out saying there are none. So it mystified me if there was a quarantine around the country for 10 years and the U.S. had bombed virtually every installation in Iraq. Over 400,000 air sorties had been uh, done on Iraq in that 10-year period. So mm. I just I didn't believe my own boss. <laughs> and knowing that uh, there were going to be lots of people that are going to die on, on this, there were going to be a lot of Iraqis that were going to get killed and they were probably going to get... There were going to be some Americans killed, and I just did not think it was right. So I became one of three federal employees who resigned um, over the Iraq War right then. Well, uh, that, we that made you snap. I mean, there was some. It was. It was just. You must have been thinking about this for some time, and then yes. boom. Well, that's right. I was. Uh, I had been waking up in the middle of the night in Mongolia. Mm. Uh, thinking about this and writing notes to myself about, you know, what my concerns were. And finally, that culminated in my sending what's called a dissent cable uh, to the State Department. It's a channel that diplomats have where you can go all the way from your desk in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, around your ambassador, around all of the bureaucracy in the State Department, and your cable lands on the Secretary of, of State's desk. Uh, with your concerns about policies. Uh, you use it at your peril. They say no retribution, no retaliation, but everybody knows that's not true. So if you decide to use it, you better be ready for the consequences. And I was thinking, well, I'm ready for them. I, I, wanna, I want it on record that I, I am very concerned about these and I wanna see what the response is back from Washington. And the response was nothing that gave me any sort of uh, confidence that uh, there was a real national security interest reason for us attacking another country. And so I resigned. And, and then you, there, there's a big step then from resigning to now becoming active in anti-war uh, and moving people towards peace. What, that, what step? How did you get to that step? Well, it took a while. You know, as a, as a uh, nearly a 40-year U.S. government employee, um, speaking out in public about challenging U.S. government policies was, you know, not one of the things that we did. We, uh, I knew more dissidents uh, in the various countries that I lived in because part of the job of a diplomat was meeting people from all walks of life and some that agreed with government, some that disagreed. So I, I knew more people outside our country who disagreed with their government than I knew in my own country of people that were disagreeing. And, and yet there were millions of people disagreeing with uh, the decision to invade and occupy Iraq. The largest um, anti-war marches in the history of the world were held in February of 2003 before the, uh, the actual invasion and occupation. But it really didn't matter to the Bush administration and to the coalition of the willing partners what their populace was saying. They were just going to do it anyway. So it and took. And why took why do you think they were so dedicated to doing it? Well, you know the the United States has this uh, little streak in it called warmongering, <laughs> and uh, they were. Uh, if, if you look at the people that were in office, it was George Bush as president, but you had uh, Vice President Cheney, you had John Bolton, 
You had Elliot Adams or Elliot Abrams, who all are uh, the last two of them are coming back into power now in the Trump administration. And the compact for the new American century, which was a, a, a neoconservative uh, roadmap to uh, to U.S. dominance, of not only the Middle East, but of, of the world, was already laid out there that uh, they needed to go take down the regimes in Iraq and Iran, North Korea. And you remember George Bush uh, had said in uh, January of uh, 2002, a year before that, uh, I was in Afghanistan when Bush at the, um, the State of the Union um, message I was sitting in front of a tiny little TV in Kabul, Afghanistan, and here we, Hamid Karzai, the interim president, had been flown all the way to Washington to sit in the halls of Congress to listen to the State of the Union. And President Bush barely recognized Hamid Karzai, but before he then said, and there are things, other places in the world that we're very concerned about, uh, Iran, Iraq, North Korea, the axis of evil. Mm, and yeah. And so they were already planning this um, this decision. They were making the decision to go ahead and uh, invade and, and occupy Iraq. While we were in Afghanistan, we, we couldn't figure out why we weren't getting the resources we needed while we were in Afghanistan. And uh, they were already being diverted to what became the invasion of Iraq. So this is, a, as you see it, a national policy towards aggression in order to achieve uh, prominence in the world. I'm afraid that's true. If you look at our history, um, I think the people of the world know our history much better than than we U.S. citizens do. We have this feeling that we are, um, you know, we, that we're peace loving. We're, um, you know, we don't want to hurt anybody else. But if you look at the history of it, uh, we have caused more wars than any other country. So I think we do have to look at our history. And that's after having been in the military 29 years and as a diplomat 16 years, I say that. We do need to look at our history. And I think also the fact that you met with a lot of people in different countries and talked to them, I, I can see that, that had an influence on you, uh, making you see things that perhaps people that don't get out to other countries don't see, people who don't uh, meet with foreigners have no idea. Uh, of perceptions, perhaps. Well, it's true. I mean, when as a U.S. diplomat, you uh, you listen to people and you listen yeah. to their concerns about their own government, as well as the impact of U.S. Uh, U.S. government policies on them. And it's uh, it's really telling when some of the very first things that new people that you're talking with start talking about the history of the United States and when the U.S. invaded. Uh, this country or that country, you know, the Latin American policies, the Monroe Doctrine that said <laughs> that we, uh, you know, that the hemisphere was our, ours. And when you look at what the U.S. did, it was ours. We invaded all sorts of countries multiple times. So that's obviously made you into a person that advocates for peace. Uh, and and what, what was the first type of advocacy you did in that respect? Well, it took a while for me to gain my confidence to speak, uh, to speak out in public. You know, as a, if you remember right after the, the uh, invasion of Iraq, uh, all the media was gung-ho, you know, go get them. And uh, uh, if, you, if you see the statistics on how much pro-war uh, media what coverage was, it was like 98%. Hmm. And, and the national media was giving about 2% to those who were disagreeing with this war. Uh, it, so it, it, it was not a popular thing at all. And I actually, I didn't know anybody in the peace community in the United States. As I mentioned before, I knew more, more people outside right. who were challenging their own government. So it took a while for for me to find my footing with with some of the organizations like Veterans for Peace that I belong to and uh, other organizations to uh, feel comfortable speaking out and telling my story of having been in the government for so long and why now I am advocating for uh, for peaceful resolution of problems and okay. that's what I supposedly for 16 years as a diplomat that's what you're supposed to be doing but. <laughs> It doesn't seem like diplomats are succeeding at that. 
Well, look, we're going to take a one minute break and then we're going to come back and I want to find out what you're doing now. What activities are going on that involve peace advocacy, anti-war advocacy. So take a break and we'll be right back with Anne Wright. Thank you. Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that, you know, may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Yukari Kunisue, the host of Konnichiwa Hawaii, Japanese talk show on ThinkTech Hawaii. Konnichiwa Hawaii is all Japanese broadcast show and is streamed live on ThinkTech at 2 p.m. every other Monday. Thank you so much for watching our show. We look forward to seeing you then. I'm Yukari Kunisue. Mahalo. Aloha. We are back and I am talking with Anne Wright. Uh, Anne is a former uh, U.S. Army colonel and worked for the State Department and now is a peace advocate and anti-war activist. Anne, uh, you're in Washington, D.C. right now and you were telling us a little bit about what you're doing. Um, what, what about uh, Korea? What, what, what is going on with that particular matter? And I, I want to also ask you about uh, Iran and eventually about the Golden Rule. <laughs> Indeed. Thank you. Well, I'm uh, here in Was Washington for a new campaign we have, which is uh, Peace Now on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, we're trying to uh, get our members of Congress to support um, President Trump uh, on his initiatives uh, for peace on the Korean Peninsula. I, uh, I don't agree with the president on a lot of things, but on this one, I certainly do, that we do need to, to finally bring an end to this uh, war um, that has been, well, a war declaration that's been going on for 70 years. Thank God there's not been uh, uh, huge military actions uh, since 1953, but uh, the threat of military action has been there. And, we hope that President Trump will be able to um, secure an agreement that satisfies the security needs of us and of the North Koreans. Who, who is your group and who's involved in, in it? Well, uh, one of the groups I'm, that's involved in this is called Women Cross the DMZ, a group of 30 women, international women from 15 countries in 2015 went to North Korea. I was one of them. Wow. Uh, Christine Ahn, who lives right here in Honolulu, was the spearhead of this uh, group. Uh, we had a peace conference with 250 North Korean women. We marched for peace in Pyongyang with 5,000 North Korean women, hmm. and then had a symposium in Kaesan in another part of North Korea, and then were the, only the third civilian group uh, to be allowed to actually ca cross the DMZ to go down into South Korea, where we then had a symposium for peace with South Korean women and then a march along the DMZ. And since then, in 2016, 17, and 18, we've had marches along the DMZ for peace, and we've met with North Korean women in various places in Asia. So we, we have been, uh, as citizen diplomats, trying to bring stories of people in North Korea who want peace, um, people in South Korea. We do a lot of public speaking and do a lot of uh, writing of articles to... Well, is, there, is, there any, is there any hope for peace in, in this? Yeah. I mean, it seems to me, you know, if you watch the evening news, uh, you, you never know what's going to happen there. Well, that's true. And sometimes the evening news uh, has its own agenda. <laughs> and sometimes it's, you know, it may be supporting one, one part of the government policy or a different part of it. Uh, there is a huge, huge uh, movement in the Korean Peninsula, both in North Korea and South Korea, to finally have peace. Uh, while Kim Jong-un has met only twice with uh, uh, President Trump, he's met officially three times with uh, President Moon of South Korea. And there have been 38 meetings uh, uh, below presidential level between the North and South Koreans. 
uh, since uh, April when the, the very first meeting took place between um, President Moon and, and Chairman Kim. Uh, the, the, there are all sorts of things that are happening in on the Korean Peninsula. The DMZ is being demined. It, the, the mines are being taken out of that. The sentry posts are being taken down. The railroad that connects North and South Korea has already been inspected. And uh, once the sanctions are lifted, uh, there will be, for the very first time in 70 years, it'll be possible for a train to go all the way from South Korea all the way to Europe because it wow. would had to have gone through North Korea. So there are lots of things that are happening. And of course, we're concerned about uh, the, the nuclear weapons that the North Koreans have. But as if, if the United States will give honest security guarantees to North Korea, uh, the uh, chairman uh, uh, Kim has already said, you know, they, they are willing to denuclearize. His whole program, ever since he's been in power, uh, has been, uh, on security and economic security. And when you look at the, the press only covers uh, his state of the, the nation, which he gives on January 1st, they only cover the, the military aspect of it, which is about 20% of his speech. 80% is talking about economic development for his country. So he wants so to give peace a chance and he's willing to get rid of uh, nuclear weapons. It sounds like what you're saying. If, if he can get some economic uh, benefit from that. Indeed, and if he can get the security guarantees that mm. the United States is not going to attack North Korea, that's the main thing. Uh, and but, certainly the decision of the Trump administration, you were talking about it, the trip to Iran that I just got Yeah, I, I wanna hear about that. And also I wanna hear about the golden rule that's coming to Hawaii. So t okay. tell us about both of those. Okay, well, just to tie in North Korea and Iran, one of the reasons that, that, that uh, it's, it's difficult right now with the North Koreans uh, because I don't think they trust the United States very much because okay. of what President Trump did with this, the, the negotiated agreement framework with the, with the Iranians. I mean, right. it took four years to finally <laughs> get this, probably the best deal that is around, and then the Trump administration backs out of it. So it doesn't give uh, the North Koreans any sense of security that even if they sign something with the United States, uh, will it hold? Well, we certainly hope it will. Um, and we hope that President Trump uh, relooks uh, the agreement with, with Iran. The other five partners in that agreement are still holding tight to it. Uh, the International uh, uh, Atomic Energy Association, AEI, as uh, each quarter has confirmed that the Iranians are, are complying with the, with the agreement. Uh, we were in Iran, we took 28 people to Iran uh, just uh, two weeks ago. Uh, we wanted to talk to government officials, we wanted to talk to um, think tanks, we wanted to talk to the ordinary people of Iran to get a sense of what's happening and, and the effect of the very brutal, strong sanctions that the international community has put on Iran. Uh, we were able to meet with the foreign minister of Iran for about an hour and a half, which was incredible. It turned out he resigned the afternoon after we'd talked with him. Yeah, hopefully it wasn't because of us, but <laughs> his, uh, his resignation was not accepted by the president of Iran. And 36 hours later, he was back in the same position. But uh, his, his comments to us were that uh, the Iranian people were very upset with him because he had negotiated this, this uh, very comprehensive um, agreement mm. of inspections of their nuclear, uh, not weapons, they've never developed a weapon, but their nuclear energy uh, production. Um, so uh, they were very dejected and the, the continuation of all of these sanctions, which the Iranian people were thinking that's going to be the benefit of giving up uh, the inspection rights into the nuclear facilities. But instead, more sanctions are being put on, and that is not helping. Okay. Uh, the in, last in the few minutes we have left, tell, tell us about the golden rule, what, what that is, and when it's coming to Honolulu, and uh, how people can get involved. Wonderful. The golden rule is a great... Uh, uh, project of Veterans for Peace. Uh, it is a historic anti-nuke boat that was in Hawaii in 1958 
four Quakers were going to sail it all the way to the Marshall Islands to try to stop atmosp atmospheric nuclear testing. The Coast Guard stopped them three different times, threw them in jail. They finally gave up. The boat disappeared for 50 years, and we found it uh, about five years ago. It's been renovated and been sailing up and down the coast of California and, and the West Coast, uh, talking about the dangers of nuclear weapons. And we are going to sail it. Uh, it's a 32-foot boat. It'll take 28 days to sail across from San Diego to arrive in Hilo about the first part of June. And then it'll be in the Hawaiian Islands for three months. And we'll be giving educational tours uh, and discussions about nuclear weapons. Then it will sail to the Marshall Islands, to Guam, and then on to Okinawa, and then on up to Hiroshima to be there hopefully by August of 2020, the 75th anniversary mm. of the dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima. And, and the goal is to bring attention to nuclear weapons and to hopefully convince people that that's not the way to proceed. Is that right? Indeed, that's so correct. And we'll, we'll be asking schools to send students down so that we can talk to students about this. It's their future that we're talking about. So we if, hope that we'll get a good welcome for the golden rule when, once she arrives here. If, if uh, schools or anyone else would like to get a hold of you, what what should they do or, or find out about the golden rule? How, how, who should they contact? Yes, you can contact me through Veterans for Peace. We have a Facebook that's up. Uh, we also have a golden rule website and you can talk uh, directly to the uh, operations officer for that. It's the goldenrule.org. Okay. Now we have a minute left and I kind of want to ask you a serious question. Uh, we, we have a lot of animosity in the world uh, and a lot of violence. Is, is there, you, are you hopeful? I mean, is there still a chance for peace uh, in our world? Well, indeed, I am hopeful. I mean, when you look at the majority of people in the world, they are peaceful, nonviolent people that do not want wars on their soils. They don't want madmen shooting up people. They, they just want to have a calm, peaceful life. That's the overwhelming majority of the people of the world. It's only the outliers that are causing us these, these problems. And it's up to us, the people of peace that want peace to help our neighbors. It's up to us to speak out and to, uh, to work on our government to get its war policies uh, under control, like stop them. Uh, and the same in our own communities, that we support people that, uh, that, that work uh, for the betterment of our communities to help people that may have mental problems and, uh, you know, things like that that we as a society need to, to work on so that everyone has a, uh, an opportunity for a peaceful, productive life. And thank you very much. Uh, very nice talking with you. Uh, best wishes to you. And uh, I, I, I guess you'll be over here with the Golden Rule in, in a short time. Oh, yes, I'm looking forward to coming home again and uh, uh, being with everyone. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we'll be back in another two weeks with another Law Across the Sea program. Aloha.